Welcome back to this special Royal Edition of 12 Days in March. This material was delivered during a series of live lectures at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. In this recording, we review lipoprotein metabolism at the level you need to know for the boards and as a prequel to lipid-lowering agents for the USMLE Step 1 exam. As with all presentations, a PDF of this recording is available at the 12 Days website. All right, let's do it. A little long, a little listy, but we'll just, again, I'm going to underscore what you absolutely need to know on this. Lots of great questions on cholesterol-lowering meds. And they're going to ask you a mechanism of action. If you do something here, what's happening there? And this is, you know, adverse effects are really the gateway to what's going on with these drugs. These are one of those stupid slides I include. But you really do, if you haven't already done it, just make up your own little table, you know, mechanism of action. You've got to be familiar with mechanism of action because they won't be talking about drugs. They'll be talking about mechanism of action. The same issue, they'll be talking through adverse effects. So you really do need to be familiar with the common adverse effects. And just, I have to do this disclaimer, is that you know, lipids by design were innocent. You know, they serve a purpose. Collomicrons, VLDL, provide energy, right? So these are triglycerides, the role of lipoprotein lipase. The metabolism generates LDL, and LDL was for membrane and steroid synthesis. That, that's, you know, that's okay. And some cells can actually synthesize cholesterol, and that's great too. So cholesterol and triglycerides, they're, they're there for a reason. We just think about them in a pathologic sense, just because of the way this country comes kind of exists and heart disease, etc. And these principles really do guide targets for drug therapy. All right, so you remember this slide, this oldie but goodie? I do. So we made a chylomicron a long time ago in GI. That was a lifetime ago. It went through the enterocyte, and it got dumped into the lacteals in the thoracic duct. And the key thing about thoracic duct is, again, not going to the liver. It's dumping it into the subclavian vein after coursing through the mediastinum. So it's going into, from the subclavian vein, it's going into the circulation for first pass through the body. So that's where we're picking up the story. And I just want to say this. This in and of itself is not that important. It's just to set you up for the drugs. So here we just ate, and they call it exogenous, the dietary pathway. We ate fat, got absorbed as chylomicrons, it's in the circulation, and here's the circulation where it passes by these capillaries with lipoprotein lipase extending off the cell wall. So lipoprotein lipase is always present on endothelial surfaces, and it's going to digest or metabolize chylomicrons into either remnants that travel back to the liver for the metabolism, or into fatty acids for purposes of storage and energy. And that's the exogenous pathway. And here's the endogenous pathway. So now we're picking up the story from the liver. All right, so the liver is now synthesizing. It's not synthesizing chylomicrons. It makes VLDL, and I just call, this is what I love to call, VLDL is the chylomicron of the liver. So the liver synthesizes VLDLs, and it's the same story. Now they're going out to the circulation where they get whopped on by lipoprotein lipase, and you get these remnants called IDL, and it's taken up by the liver as receptors in the liver, or this remnant is also metabolized to LDL that's taken up by the liver or peripheral tissues. The VLDL is also metabolized similarly to, you know, for storage and energy. I've seen precious little on lipoprotein metabolism. Maybe I'm just not looking at the right place for questions. And here's just another rendition of that because we've got some apoproteins. So we ate the damn stuff. We're talking about exogenous is di dietary chylomicrons, lipoprotein lipase, adipose, muscle, and where else. Remnants taken back up by the liver, the receptors in the liver. Exogenous, here's endogenous. I got rid of all that nonsense, so it makes VLDL just like chylomicron, adipose peripheral tissues, lipoprotein lipase. Here's your IDL, which is really the VLDL remnant, more lipoprotein lipase, hormone sensitive lipase. That's metabolized to LDL, traveling with its ApoB receptor and off to the periphery or taken up by receptors in the liver. That's the pathway. And here's superimposing the two together and making it a more complex looking slide. All right, so finally, now we'll go to the drug. So what happens to trigs, VLDL, LDL, when you change lipoprotein, lipase activity, so if you upregulate it, and what happens if you decrease VLDL secretion? And now we actually get into the drug. So that was the background. This is ugly. I've got to get a better slide. This is very busy. But here's the hepatocyte, and here's the circulation. So let's just start with the hepatocyte, and we're talking about fibrates now and how they work. The main mechanism of action, and you'll see this line, just like with TZDs, they increase expression of a transcription factor. And so transcription factors 
have to do something. In this instance, it's upregulating lipoprotein lipase. So just by definition, and based on what we just said about those pathways, if you upregulate lipoprotein lipase, what you're doing is uh, increasing metabolism of fats. And that's the most important thing to know straight away for fibrates. When you talk about this, they're specialists for triglycerides. Every, every patient, any vignette they give you in a patient where fibrates are the answer, if they're not asking about adverse effect or mechanism of action, there are always going to be patients with high triglycerides. And so by further metabolizing lipoprotein lipase, you do wind up with a little bit more IDL that spins off to HDL. So with fibrates, you can increase HDL. They won't ask that question. But you're also metabolizing triglycerides, IDL to LDL. So it's really good at reducing triglycerides, HDL. Less effective because we're metabolizing. We still have a lot of LDL with the fibrates. So the other, this is the main mechanism of action. It's also described as decreasing VLDL synthesis, not clear pathway. So on fibrate, well, here's mechanism of action. I'm setting the stage for their specialist in triglycerides, and that's how they may set you up. But then they ask about the adverse effects. That's the main questions on fibrates. Number one, they inhibit the metabolic pathway for statins, so this issue of rhabdomyolysis. And, you know, they could say given a drug with Lipitor or Torvastatin and now has muscle breakdown, what drug was given, but they can also ask you about why. And they do inhibit metabolism of the statin. So you wind up with higher statin levels occasioned by rhabdomyolysis, high CK. So that's the number one adverse effect. And number two is the coleothiasis. Stones come from decreased alpha hydroxylase activity so you're dumping more cholesterol directly into the bile and you're not making bile salts, so less bile salts favors stone development. So either of those, the interaction with statins or coleothiasis, not just coleothiasis, why are you getting coleothiasis? They can ask those derivative issues. Those are the players for fibrates. Those are the things you need to know about these drugs. Niacin, this is the best diagram you find on niacin, and they just say inhibits VLDL secretion, you know, and inhibits intrahepatic triglycerides. There's no mechanism there. I mean, it's poorly understood. They're not going to ask you about mechanism, so they're going to describe it as a drug that decreases VLDL secretion. That's good, but that's just a setup. That's how they're going to describe it. It's coming back to the lipoprotein pathway. We're not secreting triglycerides. HDL does go up. We're not getting here, so it does decrease LDL as well. So decreased triglycerides, increasing HDL, decreasing LDL. Niacin historically was referred to as the perfect cholesterol lowering drug. The only problem is there weren't really studies to support good outcomes. That was the problem with niacin. Because of the adverse effects and in contemporary trials, it didn't really show up. And so we've moved on to better alternatives. So niacin will still hold on in the, both the question bank and at the NBME just be, because the side effects are just so great to test you on. Should they ask you, although I'm describing niacin as the perfect drug, decrease trigs, decrease LDL, increase HDL, if they ask the best agent to reduce risk in a patient who had a heart attack, it's statins because of the clinical trials that have demonstrated that. If they ask the best agent to raise HDL, now that is an isolated question, it's niacin. Niacin, again, they're going to talk about a drug that inhibits VLDL secretion. That's exciting. It's going to be a high triglyceride patient. Um, but then they get again to the adverse effects. And this is a great one for adverse effects. Everybody with niacin, they take the damn stuff and get flushing. Okay, so it's adverse effects. It makes it hard for people to tolerate. They get flushing. And the relevance of the flushing is we know if you take aspirin, it prevents the flushing. So it's one of those adverse effects that we can actually prevent. And not only prevent, but if aspirin is making the flushing go away, what's the mechanism of the flushing? It's prostaglandin mediated. So they like that. That's a nifty little set of derivatives. It's not that any of this is so necessarily important, but it's just if I'm writing test questions like, oh, here's a juicy little tidbit. So I have flushing, and it goes away with aspirin, so therefore I know the flushing is from prostaglandins. The hyperuricemia as an adverse effect. So they're not going to say the uric acid level goes up. They're going to talk about some guy who had a heart attack and was put on a drug and is now coming in with a red-hot painful toe. Okay, so they develop Pedagra on treatment, and this is soft. It does cause hyperglycemia by interfering with insulin metabolism. So we don't want to use it in a diabetic. That's really soft, unlikely to last that. It's going to be one of the first two, flushing or hyperuricemia. All right, 
Cholestyramine, again, we talked about it when we did enterohepatic circulation. I guess that was GI or liver, I guess liver. So binding resins, they bind those bile salts in the intestine so they're not getting reabsorbed. And if they're not getting reabsorbed, the liver has to crank up to make fresh new bile salts. So it's going to make bile salts, but if it's going to make bile salts, bile, we know bile acids come from cholesterol. So now the liver is going to upregulate that LDL receptor. Come on, I need cholesterol to make more bile because it's all going out in the toilet and it's by that mechanism it works to lower LDL. Now we're familiar with statins and upregulation into the LDL receptor. We don't think about it for the binding resins but that is a secondary mechanism. The LDL uptick is a result of interfering with anaerobatic circulation. Again the very same mechanism by which it works also is and it produces the side effect. It's hypertriglyceridemia and the mechanism poorly understood, but the way I envision it, the liver is cranking to make these bile salts. It's just cranking to make everything. Hypertriglyceridemia develops. So the liver is active. It's making everything, including VLDL. This will be the language of the adverse effect. Fibrates, niacin decrease triglycerides. Statins doesn't do much for triglycerides. This is the only drug put on a cholesterol-lowering drug after a heart attack, and the follow-up triglycerides went up. That's how they're telling you the patient was put on cholestyramine. All right, and this is just simple folliness. So Estamibi Zetia, it was a drug that was incidentally discovered. So they were looking for something else and found out it lowered cholesterol, and it lowered cholesterol because it blocked absorption of cholesterol. And I didn't even know there was a neiman pick C1-like-1 protein located anywhere, let alone in the intestine. So that's how it works, but the bottom line is you're not absorbing cholesterol. You never really see questions on this drug. You got like no side effects. It's a nice drug. It's an add-on drug. They didn't really do a lot of clinical trials other than say it lowers cholesterol when added to a statin. All right, and you guys didn't fall for my little PCSK9 inhibitor question. And there's just pathway. Interesting because it's still a newer agent. I, I just haven't seen it coming in at the QBanks or NBME, but eventually it's going to show up because, again, it's a unique mechanism of action. The agent itself targets the LDL receptor for degradation, LDL receptor. Here's the PCSK9, and they're made. Here's LDL binding uh, LDL, and this attaches to it, and the thing just gets gobbled up. Well, if you have a monoclonal antibody against that little booger, now the LDL is available for recycling the LDL receptor. There is getting recycled. So we know right now that monoclonal antibodies against this particle is useful for cholesterol lowering because you have increased LDL receptor and this is where it's going. Oral agents are in development that are going to be long acting like three months at a time and they look okay and they're coming. And lastly we're statins. So the first agent was called Mevacor, and Meva, pay attention to Meva and Mevacor. So we have this biosynthetic pathway to get to cholesterol. They don't really bug you too, too much about it. But if you're inhibiting this enzyme right here, right, you're inhibiting that enzyme right there, you're not getting to mevalonate and ultimately to cholesterol. And they like this question, you know, you're inhibiting this, what happens to the level? And so in the options, they'll say, oh, increase a mevalonic acid level. No, we never got there. And as a result, the mechanism of action. We're not making cholesterol. What's going to happen in the liver? The liver is going to upregulate the LDL receptor. So life is actually easy understanding uh, with the statins. They're kind of least complex of the whole process. They're not going to ask you about these intermediary steps. Adverse effects. Myalgia is a big ticket item with these drugs, at least 10%, if not more. But unfortunately, you know, people take cholesterol drugs who are old and already have aches and pains, so it's impossible to sort them out. But the real issue, if they're going to do statin, is going to be the overlap with those drugs that are inhibitors of metabolism, i.e., the fibrates. So the fibrates for sure, but the other drugs, erythromycin, ketoconazole, also interfere with metabolism. They put you at risk for at rhabdo. Those are easy questions if they ask. They have a statin, they're putting you on a drug, and now their muscle is breaking down. Or the muscle is breaking down, what drug did he just use? So that's it. Just there's mechanism of action to summarize for you. There's the adverse effects summarized for you. And here's questions summarized for you. Let's have fun with these. Good. Uh, like 100% of you got it. I mean, that's the story.
Metabolic syndrome, so there's your high triglyceride situation, pain, redness, swelling. You recognize that as Podagra, which medication was used? Niacin. Well, you think I'm going to leave it there? No, because I don't do that. So they can ask what the mechanism of action for that was, uh, decreased VLDL synthesis, secretion. They could have changed this scenario to patients diagnosed with hypertension. Has the same exact story. Your drug is hydrochlorothiazide now, interfering with uric acid secretion that will cover when we do musculoskeletal. Oh, yeah, you better have this one here. This 100% without even looking. Booyah. Yep, good. All right, but I, I did this just to underscore how they ask these stupid questions. It's like, here it is, and in haste, you see this HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor, right? And you think, oh, that's the answer. Well, it's, first of all, transcription, decreased transcription. No, if anything, it's increased transcription because you're blocking the enzyme. Mevalonic degradation, we don't get to mevalonic acid. Increased synthesis, we never get there just to be aware. People got it, but it's just how deceiving they are. And this is the last one. I, didn't, I forgot about antianginals. Let's get this one, and we've got to move on. All right, looks like you guys are on top of it. Again, this is just to un underscore an obscure piece of information you need to hold on to. We don't have cholestyramine on a radar screen because we're not really using it for cholesterol management and coronary disease. It's all about statins and other exciting things. But again, it's hanging in there by adverse effect or they can come back with mechanism of action. All right, those are the lipid-lowering agents. And that concludes this discussion of lipoprotein, metabolism, and lipid-lowering agents for the USMLE Step 1 exam. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at Windsor Castle or 12 Days in March. Thank you.